Hey friends, it's me. I'm back with a little bit of a tutorial on a few neat little things. Um, it's good to be back. A lot of people, or I don't want to say a lot of people, but some people, uh, more than one person, asked for some, some tidbits of information on uh, how to use the cooler stuff in Kerbal Space Program Interstellar Extended, currently maintained by Freethinker. Awesome, awesome person that puts so much awesome into this mod that I can't even, I, I, I just can't, I mean, just thank you so much, Freethinker, for, for continuing to make such a wonderful creation, um, and to keep it maintained and updated. It's just so much fun. I, I can't even explain how much fun this is. Um, but a few things to note, uh, Kerbal Sp Space Program 2, Part 2, is coming out in 2020. Um, this seems so... Like, I've been playing this game for so long, I kind of, like, didn't even think about the prospect of a part two. Um, it just blows my mind. And they're gonna, I mean, the, the, the there was a, there's a video on YouTube, um, where, uh, the person in charge is, like, talking to Scott Manley and talking about all kinds of cool things. And you can tell the, the person is a fan. He is just, you know, immediately right away he's like, oh, it needs multiplayer, it needs interstellar, it needs this, it needs that, it needs colonies and resource, you know, gathering on other planets, and I'm like, oh, this guy, this guy definitely <laughs> uses or has used the Interstellar extended mod, and that's, it, it just blows my mind um, how, how things are coming together, and um, I'm just so grateful that, that uh, Fortune, for me, has turn, turned around, and suddenly I have access to high-speed internets again, I don't have to do things through my phone, so I can actually make and upload a video and update uh, Kerbal Space Program and the Interstellar mod, which I haven't been able to do in a long time. Um, just, you know, I had the old versions, and so I've updated everything, and I don't have all my old mods installed, just, you know, uh, Interstellar Extended, uh, Prop Monitor, and, like, one or two other things um, that still work with, uh, you know, uh, that I haven't um, updated yet, but I wanted to make this video here real quick. Um, and we're going to talk about a few things, uh, the Z-Pinch engine. Uh, we're going to talk about the Z pinch. We're going to talk about uh, antimatter, um, pro um, positrons, warp travel. We're going to talk about some stuff. Um, now, take a look here. Um, this is a teeny tiny little vessel. Uh, it's about the size of a fighter craft. Uh, it doesn't have a whole lot going on. It's got a Z pinch engine there, uh, which is cool. Uh, we're going to go into some tutorials about that. But if you take a look, I mean, this is this thing's tiny. Um, I think its mass is something like 15 metric tons, uh, a little under that, you know, 15,000 kilograms, 14 and a half thousand, something like that. Um, and the Z-Pinch here is scaled down to 1.25 meters. Um, uh, tweak scale allowed me to do this. I don't have any other mods installed, just downloaded the Interstellar, so I'm assuming that scaling the Z-Pinch down to 1.25 meters is valid, um, and it allows us to create this cool, nifty little craft right here. Um, important thing to note, when you're working with the Z-Pinch, is it starts off in a mode that only wants to burn fusion pellets. Uh, it won't use your other resource there. Um, so you actually have to manually switch it on. And uh, I recorded this all the way through without sound. Um, so I'm actually using editing software to dub my voice back into it. But if you look here, you just click on the, the fusion pellets um, bar, um, and it will... Uh, you know, it'll, it'll switch when you click on it to nitrogen. Now, when you stage the engine, it's going to switch back to fusion pellets. Um, so you'll have to switch it back after you stage the engine uh, to nitrogen uh, in order for it to actually use that fuel and produce significant thrust. Otherwise, uh, you're not even going to get a kilonewton of thrust out of it as it just burns fusion pellets, and that's just not ideal. Um, we're going to go into the VAB here in a moment. And I'm going to kind of show you the ins and outs of this vessel um, so that you can kind of see, like, how it's working. Uh, it's uh, just a few nitrogen tanks there. And there's a nitrogen cryostat. Um, this is important because we want to use uh, nitrogen gas as our RCS repellent. Um, and the cryostat allows us to turn that into nitrogen gas using the fancy little... Um, airbags there. So it'll store it in the, the baguettes in the cryo tank. You turn the cryo tank um, from pure liquid nitrogen to you know having a little bit of nitrogen gas and then the RCS thrusters can use that gas to maneuver. 
Um, and here in a moment I'm going to spend a lot of time fiddling around <laughs> with the uh, controls and ultimately what we're going to end up doing is throttling the RCS all the way down to 0.5% power uh, because they are incredibly powerful and use a lot of nitrogen um, even when they're turned all the way down. Uh, so just to conserve fuel and because you don't really need that humongous push when you're just doing micro adjustments near a station, uh, we're going to turn it, you know, down. Pretty far down. And um, with, with this video, I'm probably not going to mess around too much with cuts or anything like that. I'm still getting the hang of that. I'm using this free uh, software to to do this editing and I'll, I'll play around with it more and I'll get better at editing videos and I'll maybe one day be able to produce a uh, coherent and cohesive and fun to watch video that is not too long and that sort of thing. In the meantime, um, just kind of fast forward until you see something exciting and I'll uh, hopefully be explaining what you're seeing <laughs> when you're looking at it. Uh, but for right now we're just adjusting, doing some last moment checks here to make sure that we're going to be able to maneuver um, you know, using the RCS later on when we get to that point. Um, that docking point port right there is right over the center of mass of the vessel. Uh, I attached it to the capacitor, um, the, the red band there. I attached it to the capacitor there and then used offset to move it down uh, to the location it's in because there's a radiator there. I couldn't attach it directly on top of the radiator. Um, for purists that don't want to you know, mess around with like crossfeed issues and, hab and people that use habitable living sp or um, what's the thing that makes sure that like your kerbals can't crawl through, you know, a fuel tank that doesn't have a port in the middle. Um, I think it's like habitable living space or something like that. Anyway, um, that's just for docking and then the kerbals are actually going to get out um, using the hatch. Uh, now here we're looking at the magnetometers that are mounted right on the fins there of the um, of the warp, the folding warp drive. Uh, they're mounted there because they fit there and they look cool when they're extended, like it's some sort of like spaceship with like laser beams. Um, but this thing actually has a mission where it's going to fly up and determine the best location to harvest antimatter around a planet. It's going to you know do some readings, and then from there it will relay those coordinates to a harvester that will position itself in that location and harvest the antimatter. Uh, the reason why we're not using the harvester for the scouting process is the harvester is obviously going to be much much larger and so we're going to use the smaller vessel to do the running around and then just put the harvester where it needs to go uh, it's the idea using these little dual technique magnetometers to uh properly um identify what is it called oh uh, i'm probably going to get it wrong i think it's the van allen belt uh it's the spot where like you know the magnetic field captures the most antimatter around a planet that has a magnetic field strong enough to capture antimatter. Uh, you have a few candidates. Um, Kerbal, the sun, being one. <laughs> uh, if you don't want to do that, you can do Joule. Um, hang out, I think it's uh, 6,000 kilometers above Joule. Uh, so 6 million meters above Joule, I think, is a sweet spot uh, to get the most antimatter. I could be wrong. could be 8 million. I don't know. It's between Joule and Lathe. Between Joule and Lathe, uh, you're going to get the, the most antimatter out of Joule. Uh, another sweet spot is going to be Eve. Incidentally, Eve is a wonderful spot to harvest antimatter because of the size and density of the planet. It has got uh, quite the magnetic field pretty far out from it that will happily you know, snatch up all that antimatter and store it there. And then you can go by and collect it like it's free money. Um, anyway, we're not going to launch this thing into space as is because we need a shroud around it. It's just kind of like looking like this right here right now so that you can get an idea of what um, is going on with it. But we're going to jump into the VAB uh, shortly and deconstruct a little bit so you can get a better idea. Uh, I like throwing lights inside those things because you know, it makes it easier to see when you zoom in and you need to click on it. <laughs> uh, it's so frustrating trying to click on things in the dark in a small... Anyway, there's a light in there for obvious reasons so that I can see what I'm doing. Um, if you look over here, uh, if you have good enough resolution on this stream, you can kind of see the readouts there. Uh, we're not using a lot of power besides the positron uh, storage tank. Um, so our reactor is running, you know, basically at nothing. Um, it's, it, like 
besides the positron storage tank, there's enough um, juice flowing through this to run a few computers, like a few high-end gaming computers. And then there's, you know, an additional seven and a half kilowatts for the uh, storage of the positrons. Incidentally, nothing this thing produces 2.6 gigawatts of power. It's perfectly capable of just sustaining that for a really long time. Um, obviously, if you're playing in like a career mode, those those positrons are going to be expensive to start off with. Um, so, you know, in, in your career mode, you might want to set up and, and harvest these things beforehand before building these advanced vessels. But, you know, whatever. You know, let's jump in here and take a look at the, the blueprint for the vessel that we're going to be flying today. Let's go ahead and load it up. And there we go. Okay. All right, so we have here uh, what I like to call the Ankh, um, just because it needed a name. And first, right off the bat, you can see it's a very simple vessel. Um, we're going to remove this here radiator so that you can see underneath of it. Uh, it's just graphene. It's been scaled up quite a bit uh, there to get the um, dissipation requirements correct so you can see producing 2.7 something, dissipating 4. Uh, so we're, you know, we're, we're in a good balance there. Um, so we're going to take that off. There we go. And you can see underneath the uh, inner workings are, once again, simple. you got your Z-Pinch drive scaled to 1.25 meters. Um, tweak scale allows it without any modifications. Came with the package for the warp uh, mod, so it must be valid. Um, but the idea of having such a small and powerful engine is... You know, just why I love this game. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, we're going to take a look at the Alcubi air drive. You can see that we have um, something like 50 to 1 uh, warp mass ratio. You want something absurd so that it charges very quickly so that you're not spending a lot of time just sitting there charging. Um, so this thing will charge in under a minute. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's like, honestly, I think it's like 30 seconds to charge. Um with positrons, which is good because you don't want to sit there burning a lot of positrons over a lot of time because positrons are expensive and hard to replace. Um, so you want something that just bam, charges right up and you go so that you can maintain warp at a lower power rate than you are when you're charging. Um, so let's see, um, what am I pointing at here? Okay, yeah, so you got your warp drive and yeah, basic structure, cockpit, capacitor, warp drive, uh, storage rings, and yeah, you got your, uh, oh yeah, it's the positron reactor right there, uh, it's 1.25 as well. We throttle it down. Um, if you notice the, the heat management display up there moving as I move the throttle, uh, that's how I get this thing in line with, you know, the amount of radiators that I have. Since it's so powerful, I can, I can afford to turn it down to keep my vessel from disintegrating, so I just you know, at full power, it's going to require quite a bit, so we put it down. I found the sweet spot for this particular vessel is about 82% power. Um, that is, you know, going to depend vessel to vessel, depending on how you create yours. So you're going to just adjust these things to get that sweet spot, you know, and make your stuff good. Uh, so let's see, yeah, 82 produces that 2.77. If we were to, um, I tried control Z and after I touched that part again and it unfortunately made it uh, not possible for me to control Z it back on. Um, so I just kind of slapped it back on here after a second or two when I realized control Z wasn't going to work. There we go. All right. So I just threw it back on just willy nilly just to show you, uh, you know, how the, um, the heat management would change after the pieces were back on. And as you can see, we're back in the green. And you know, it doesn't doesn't take much if you just kind of fine tune everything um, for what you need. And since uh, some updates have been made to the to the mod, um, that warp drive there works so sweet, and you don't need to spend a lot of delta v in time circularizing your orbit anymore because it calculates for you a proper um, you know drop out of warp orbit. Um, based on you know the gravity of the planet and some other things basically now now instead of you know that last video where I showed you how to do a whole bunch of gravity uh, Breaking maneuvers to slow down so that you could finally use you know a smaller amount of Delta V to actually just fire the engine and circularize your orbit after dropping out of warp from a funky angle Well now you don't have to worry about any of that anymore 
um, because these things are packed full of computing technology that can do the calculations for you. And it's great because who goes to space without a computer? Seems like an odd idea to go to space without a computer, but now we have computers to go to space with on our computer simulated space game. It's great. All right. So what are we looking at here? Yeah, we're still just going over kind of the basic parts. Um, you can see that there's not a whole lot of clipping going on, just like stuff just like thrown right on there. It's in a line. You got your engine, you got your fuel tanks. Um, they're all filled with liquid nitrogen, obviously. Um, you know, it's an ideal medium there for the Z-Pinch um, in, in space. The Z-Pinch no longer works in atmosphere. You have to use the Aerospike Z-Pinch in atmosphere. Uh, if you want to use that engine, you know, to launch. Uh, the Aerospike Z-Pinch engine works wonderfully. Um, you know, yeah, make it the right size, give it lots of air intake. It's got its own air intake, so you don't need to add a whole lot. Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, we're not going to use that on this particular vessel because I like the form factor that we're going with here. Uh, so we're going to use an ordinary chemical rocket. Um, but certainly it wouldn't be a stretch to modify this design to include the Aerospike Z-Pinch and then it would launch on its own because that thing is awesome. Uh, but we're not going to do that because then I'd have to throw a refrigerator unit on there. It would make it heavier. You know, I, I, I like the idea of just using smaller parts and making this thing under 15 tons uh, for the warp drive. Um, we also got a capacitor because I like running that whenever I'm using positrons or um, any other volatile medium to run it just in case I have to emergency shut down uh, the systems and then restart it. I want to have a capacitor as opposed to a battery so that I get that quick uh, quick exchange of electricity. Also if your computer is slower um, having a capacitor helps with the maintaining warp if your computer does a calculation like maybe a little bit slower than it should, misses a number, weird things start happening in the warp and your vessel like decides to drop out of warp because it decides it for a split second it didn't have enough power to maintain. Uh, the capacitor, the capacitor is great. It, it, it helps prevent that. It um, doesn't completely eliminate it, but if you build your vessel right, it you don't have to worry about it at all. It's not a thing that happens. This thing will maintain warp until it runs out of positrons. It's great. Uh, let's see, just doing the last few last minute checks. Got the you know, the lights, the fuel, communications, and yeah, looks pretty good. So we're going to switch on over to the vehicle assembly building, and we're going to load this thing onto a rocket. Again, plain old chemical rocket uh, to get this thing into space, way overpowered. Um, but we're not going to use the, the Aerospike Z-Pinch because I liked the look, <laughs> basically, of how this craft came out. Um, it might look cooler when you design it with the Aerospike and don't use the chemical rocket. I'd love to see your design. Um, let's see here. A few last minute checks. Everything looks good. Way more fuel and thrust weight ratio than we need. And some boosters. And it's still under a mil. Okay. Looks great. Um make sure we got peoples yep we got valentina we got sarah they're gonna they're gonna go on an, an adventure an interplanetary adventure i didn't um uh install the world beyond yet or reinstall rather the world beyond um it is definitely probably my favorite uh extra planet pack but um I haven't updated that one yet. I was just so excited. I just wanted to get the bare bones in here and get a video going so I could make another video for you guys um, since I, I suddenly have the ability to do so. I will up, you know, next video I'm going to gonna definitely have some planet packs and stuff for us to go to. But today we're staying inside the Kerbal system and we're going to get there with an overpowered rocket. Here we go. Uh, looks good. Looks like a rocket. It's pointed up. It's important. Up is the, yeah. It's pointed up. And, yep, giant, giant rocket. Not actually that giant, but let's see. Uh, you guys ready to go to space? I think it's ready. All right, let's do a systems check. And wait, did we, wait, hang on. Yeah, uh, I kind of have to get in here and get some things before, yeah, system checks gonna require a little bit of navigation. Um, I had all these things open for you before, but now I gotta go in here and manually open them up again. So just give me one second, and I will have these windows up so we can see what we're doing. 
There we go. Let's see, let's see. Put a light in there. All right. Reactor control window. Check. Z pinch. Let me click on you, Z pinch. Nope. 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 No, maybe? Ah. Alright, let's try something else. Let's get it here and click on... No. No. There we go. Okay. Let's click on that. And then click on that. Got our warp control window. Check. Alright, Z-Pinch. I need to click on you. Where are you at, Z-Pinch? Almost. There we go. All right. Let's see. Get our power. Yep. There we go. Don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. Just put this over. Oh, that'll fit right there. There we go. Yeah. Now we're looking good. Okay. A few last minute uh, adjustments. Three, two, one. Launch. And we're going to space. Okay. So, again, I'm not going to cut this video. I'm probably going to save the fancy cutting for the next one. So I'm just going to talk over the launch. I'm sure by now everyone has seen a launch. We're done a launch. Um, it looks like a launch. You point up and you fire. Around 10,000, you're going to do your your gravity turn. Um, this I, I, I do mine a little differently. I wait till the solid rocket boosters run out and then I do my gravity turn. That generally happens at around 11,000 for me. Um, seems to just be how I design rockets. I don't know what the deal is there. Um, but if you look up there, about 11,000, there we go, 12,000. Oh, this one went a little bit longer. Okay. 14,000, 15,000. Yeah, we're going to have a we're going to have a very steep orbit. But that's okay. Um, we have a monstrously overpowered rocket. We are wasting fuel by the gallons. Look at all that plasma for no purpose at all. Yeah, just throw that away. There we go. Okay. So, point at the horizon. Now that we've cleared the plasma layer, there we go. Now we're cooking along. Oh yeah, super steep orbit. Yeah, that's just wasteful is what that is. <laughs> Oh, uh, NASA's looking at this right now like, oh yeah, oh yeah, buddy, stay away from us. We're not hiring you. <laughs> I mean, obviously they'd never hire me, but come on. Um, anybody and their grandma at home can do a better orbital insertion than what I just did there, but who cares? We're, we're flying an interstellar spaceship. We can do what we want. So, let's get rid of that. We don't need that. Let's do a barrel roll, Fox. There we go. All right. Looking good. Looking good. Okay, so that was unnecessary. Um, we didn't need to burn nearly all that fuel to do that. There's completely no no point. Once we're in space, we can just warp away, so there's really no need for the rest of that rocket at all. Um, this was just, you know, an exercise in wastefulness. You know, our funding for our program might be cut next time because of this, but it was a spectacular launch with zero difficulties, so what are you going to do? Um, and since we're good space stewards, we're not going to like launch that out into interplanetary space. We are going to go ahead and disconnect this right now so that it falls right back to the planet and burns up the atmosphere. There we go. Look at us being good people. Not, uh, not littering. Yay, not littering. Okay, another barrel roll, Fox. The barrel roll is an important maneuver uh, to learn. It's it's absolutely essential. It's the first thing you should master before anything else. Before you even launch a craft, you put a pod on the launch pad and you make it do a barrel roll. And then you will you will level up. Trust me. Okay, so we're gonna make sure that we have our engine set to nitrogen. Because as I said, it won't start off that way. So if you if you don't have it, see there you go. It produces produces the thrust. That's 104 kilonewtons of thrust on a 14 and a half uh, thousand kilogram vessel. <laughs> it's great. Okay, now what we're going to do here, um, I, I love by the way that the raster prop monitor mod still works in this version of Kerbal. Um, it's, it's glorious. 
It's absolutely glorious that this, this age-old mod right here still works and calculates delta v for us appropriately. Um, I don't know exactly how exact that is, but it seems to line up pretty well uh, with what I've experienced in-game. So right there we are going to space with a computer that tells us how much fuel we actually have. It's great. Uh, let's get a few more systems going. Take a look, make sure... Yep, barrel roll in the opposite direction. Check. Oop. Extra. A little too much barrel roll, guys. Alright. We can we can do other things besides barrel rolls. No? Alright. Valentina and Sarah are having a little too much fun in there. We, we have to go to work. We, we have a video to make. Apparently, apparently they're, they're just going to keep barrel rolling. I don't know why. Okay. So let's do... Let's see... We are able to produce more than enough energy to achieve sublight speed and escape from the planet. We're going to go 0 .004 the speed of light. Um, let's make sure that we have our power management up so that we can see how much we're using. So just take a second. Alright, so as we start charging, you see the radiators immediately heat up. Um, they're, they're, they're glowing already. Uh, if you take a look, though, our waste heat is actually not getting to a you know, super critical point. Um, it, it rises up, it hits a point, and then it starts uh, to reach equilibrium. Our power surges back up, and we are good to go. And as soon as that thing is ready, boom, we are off, and then it is no longer required to produce such enormous amount of power, it starts cooling off immediately, and as you can see, systems are good. And one important thing to note is, um, you know, previously I had a lot of issues with these vessels falling apart. So what I did with this, you see that barrel roll and warp? You see how we didn't disintegrate? You see, you see that? That's why barrel rolls are important. Now let me tell you how this magic works. I am not using indestructible joints or unbreakable joints or anything like that. Every single part on this vessel, each individual part uh, that I could think of, is auto-strutted to grandparent part, not root, not heaviest. Um, you want grandparent part. Uh, I'll tell you why in a second. But also, in addition to grandparent part auto-strutting for every single piece on this vessel, you want rigid attachment to go along with that. Okay. Uh, with rigid attachment and auto strut grandparent, it will not disintegrate when you move it in warp. So you can change speed. We jumped up to light speed right there without any issues whatsoever. We are currently sitting at a comfortable and easy to maintain power level with the reactor, and we are moving right along. Um, now, with, with auto strut, you want to use grandparent part because it doesn't change. If you use heaviest part, that can change. Um, as fuel, you know, moves around the vessel or whatever. Uh, it has the possibility of changing. Uh, if you use root part, that can change if you ever dock the vessel. Uh, once you dock a vessel and then undock it, generally the docking port becomes the root part of the vessel. So you'll have everything auto strutted to the docking port. And that's going to cause issues. If you use grandparent part, that stays the same throughout, you know, weird stuff that may happen to your craft. Um, so when calculations are done in warp, whether your computer's fast or slow, your, your vessel stays together, and it's, it's wonderful. So you can do things like point at your target while moving at the speed of light, and everything just works out. Um, it's going to take us about four and a half minutes to get to Elu uh, at the speed of light here, so we could speed up, or we can just time accelerate. It really doesn't matter. Um, but as you can see, we are just trucking along. The radiators are fine. The power management's fine. We are hardly using any positrons at all because this is such a light vessel with such warped mass ratio. It takes, you know, less than 100 megawatts. Uh, we don't have connection right now because we have a pilot, uh, is what I was pointing out right there. But um, there is a antenna there for communication should their need arise. Uh, this is, doesn't have a probe core, so it is not an autonomous vessel. It requires a skilled pilot um, to fly or to operate. Now, let's see here. We're going to jump, I believe. We're going to increase our speed. Yeah, 10 times the speed of light. And power management still ideal. We're not even using, you know, a quarter of what we could. 
and we're going to get there in a few seconds, so we're going to have to slow down. Should be able to see Elu on the horizon soon. Yeah, yeah, we're going to see it here in a second. No, two minutes, I let's speed back up again. That doesn't take too long. Let's get there quick. There we go. Zoom in right on in. And there's Elu on the horizon. Should uh, come into view here in a second more clearly. And when it does, we're going to slow down. Um, because we don't want to overshoot. Okay. And instead of trying to figure out a perfect angle to come in on this planet, um, all the calculations done based off the speed, gravity drag, and things like that, so really we don't have to do much. We slow down, we slow down, we slow down, and then we just drop out of orbit, or drop out of warp, and we check our orbit. Oh, how beautiful is that? It's lovely. We have a lovely, lovely orbit. How much effort did that take us? None. We launched, we pointed, and we arrived. That easy. Um, warp travel and interplanetary interstellar travel has never never been easier never been more enjoyable now we can get out and do some science and colonization and like the logistics are just so much um more reasonable more e easier to manage i mean obviously you have to if in your career mode you're gonna have to get up to this tech level to get this level of efficiency and performance um your starting materials are not gonna start off you know, with this level of, of awesomeness, unless you're playing in sandbox mode with all the upgrades applied. Okay. All right. So one thing you can do now that is so much easier than the last time I showed you how to do um, a gravity breaking maneuver to adjust your, your orbit and to circularize and to do things like that. Now we're just going to charge up and very slowly move closer to the planet. Um, we're just going to warp at it without any fear of blowing up. This is going to be great. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? Could I mean, I think it's safe. You know, instruments are fluctuating there. It seems totally legit. See? Done. No problems, right? Oh, hang on. What's this? It put us in an orbit that's above the surface, but that orbit is about 7 kilometers above the surface. Now, Elu doesn't have, like, humongous mountains and mounds. It's pretty flat overall. Um, but that's still too close for comfort for me. So we're gonna, we're gonna adjust our orbit here a little bit. Uh, let's see. Point prograde. There we go. And then let's, uh, let's point a little away from prograde. Okay, point radial out. There we go, radial out, radial out, there we go, about 70 from horizon, 20 from uh, radial out. So 20 degrees off from radial out, 20 degrees off from 90 degrees, 70 degrees from the horizon, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're pointing almost up, okay, almost up. Now when you're pointing almost up like this, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to raise if you're at apoapsis, you're going to raise your periapsis. Uh, if you're away from your apoapsis, you're actually going to bring your apoapsis um, like around, like behind you, and bring your periapsis towards you is what's going to happen. Or, um, I'm sorry, opposite direction. You're going to put the apoapsis in front of you, and periapsis is going to come towards you from behind. But what you're going to do is eventually raise your periapsis um, and move your apoapsis position. So that you can, uh, you know, ma still maintain that that same shape of your orbit, just without crashing into the planet. All right, so we're going to do our mission here, which is to read magnetic fluctuations, and we see a number that is times ten to the negative ten. That 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 you're not going to get anything with ten times to the negative ten. Um, you might, if you get something that's like one or two times ten to the negative three you're getting antimatter out of that. But ELU is not composed of stuff that will give us a magnetic field strong enough to do anything um, in the neighborhood of actionable antimatter materials. So ELU is a dud. Um, guess we won't be building an antimatter harvester out here. Okay, Sarah and Valentina, you will have to hunt elsewhere. So other possible targets. Um, we've, we've discussed Jewel 
and Kerbal and Eve. So between those, what should we choose? Let's see. Start charging the drive and pick a target. Jewel seems like the obvious choice. I mean, it would just, we could park pretty much anywhere and it would be ideal, but that's a lot of ground to cover. And we kind of haven't really had the opportunity, I, I haven't had the opportunity to, to build much around EVE. Um, it's easy to get to with a chemical rocket, um, difficult to colonize with chemical rockets. And generally speaking, it's so much easier to get to Jewel um, with, with the interstellar technology. Like a lot of times to, to, to warp drive to Eve in the past, I would have to warp out to Jewel or warp to Kerbal, adjust my velocity that way, and then warp to Eve in order to get a decent gravity capture. Um, nowadays, you can just point right at Eve and just go there. So you can put a whole space station around orbit of Eve with minimal effort these days. Um, so kind of defeats the purpose going way out to Elu, but I didn't have to do any kind of gravity maneuvers. I just flew out to Elu. And now I'm going to go ahead and warp to Eve. Because uh, I do actually already have a station warped out there. Um, generally in career mode, I would build stations in space and then use chemical rockets to position them, or I would just use rockets to fly building materials to a planet and then construct the planet, or the station around the planet. Um, now I can construct a station anywhere and put a warp drive on the station and position it and around any planet I want. So I can have mobile station. Uh, I mean, th the opportunities, just with having a computer attached to the warp drive that does the calculation for me, so that I don't have to spend all my time circularizing my orbit, which like consumed my life. Not to say it wasn't fun, like it's, it was fun figure, just figuring out how to do that. But um, now if Freethinker had like, you know, an option to like turn that on and off or maybe have it like an unlockable tech or something like that, or maybe he does and I just haven't gotten to that in the career mode yet, um, that'd be cool. Cause then that would um, give me the option of having that challenge or not. Um, so that'd be neat. <coughs> Pardon me. All right, so we're almost at Eve. And it's so easy to do now. You just point, and your craft doesn't explode, and your power stays ideal, and you should see Eve on the horizon there. Soon there's a little glimmer of it. Gonna go ahead and mute this so I can cough real quick. Okay, and... Gonna drop out of orbit here. Three, two, one, uh, nowish? Yeah. Okay. Right on the nose. Right at the bullseye. How beautiful was that? Look at that perfect frickin' orbit. I mean, eccentricity is less than <laughs> less than a hundredth of a degree. Or a ten yeah, it's so good. So good. So good. It requires another barrel roll. Alrighty, so we are gonna go ahead and take a look. See here, we are at what are we at? Three hundred thousand, and I actually don't even remember. I think I completely by the time I got here. Um, remember, I, I recorded this and then realized there was no sound because <laughs> uh, I didn't have the microphone on. So I'm recording my voice over this uh, using fancy editing software. <laughs> That's not first for me. Um, so I actually think I forgot to even take a reading. Um, and immediately went to um, docking mode, basically. Uh, so here's where things get interesting, because I do not realize that there is something catastrophically wrong at this point, and so I confidently charge forward. Um, so instead of warping to the station, I conservatively plot an intercept orbit. I take a look at my instruments, I'm there, station's there, and best time to meet up is probably right around where those purple spots are. So we're gonna look ahead and make ourselves an orbit at the descend or a maneuver at the descending node, so that we can make that intersection happen. We're off by about seven degrees, so we're gonna have to do a couple adjustments here. It's probably gonna take more than one maneuver. As you can see, we are coming in at an angle. All right, so let's uh, let's adjust normal.
Ah, yes. That is a good adjustment of normal. A little more. A little more normal. More normalness. There we go. Okay, let's speed up a little bit. Nope. Let's not speed up a little bit. We actually need to adjust our, uh, our radial here. Make sure that we align our orbits appropriately. Uh huh. Good. 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 Alrighty. Perfect. There we go. Now, that purple spot's actually not where we're going to end up uh, intersecting. That's just like showing me that in a, a capture encounter is possible with a different encounter possible actually where we wanted our encounter to occur. Um, so it's going to take a couple adjustments, but that's a-okay. We have plenty of delta V. About 2,500, a little more meters per second. So let's go ahead and point out to the maneuver node. There we go. It's going to take uh, a little under 400 meters per second to accomplish this maneuver. 366, it looks like. And... Looks good. All right, so we're going to time accelerate so that we can make our appointment there. Remember, we used the chemical rocket to, to uh, get us into orbit. We used the warp drive to get to this planet. So this is going to be the first time we're going to actually use the Z-Pinch, aside from the initial, you know, test burn that we did, uh, you know, there to blow up the debris behind us um, when we launched. So this will be the first maneuver using the Z-Pinch engine. Let's see how it goes. Oh, overshot. Just a hair, but that's okay. This is our final adjustment. So full power, pumping out 104.105 kilonewtons of thrust. Let's take a look at our instruments. Oh yeah, looking good. Okay, so 250, 249. If you look down here at the delta V requirement for the burn, about 30 seconds to burn at full throttle. And we're going to adjust that down just a little bit to make sure we don't go too nuts with it. And then as it burns down, we're going to realize that we should probably speed up a little. <laughs> we're going too slow. So we're going we're gonna to kick this back up in increments back up to full throttle. As we watch our delta V requirement and burn time requirement. And we're going to zoom in. Okay, about 30, 20, 10, done. Look at that. Within two meters per second. Alright. So that's going to put us in a good spot with an encounter right down there. Boom. Looks good. Okay. One more adjustment, though. Because as we see, our relative velocities are actually uh, a little off, but that's okay because we're so far away. Um, angles and inclination at this point are also, you know, I mean, you have to understand, we're, we're still really far away. You know, we're 25 kilometers away from this thing, 30, 40 kilometers away, and we're off by 140 degrees, but we're going to get there. Um, we're just, you know, going to have to go around the planet, and that'll, that'll make things right. Now, if you see over here, that orange spot is um, where our closest encounter is going to be, um, but the purple one is ultimately going to be where we're going to end up. Um, now, of course, the color will change to orange once it becomes the one that we're going to actually end up at. But this is just a, an additional encounter uh, to set us up for the final approach. Um, again, it, when you're when you're doing this yourself, you're going to do your your rendezvous m maneuvers. You know, probably with a lot more uh, efficiency than myself. Um, or not, I, I don't know. It, but if this helps you or not, or gives you some, some ideas on how you can uh, use these tools to your advantage, I hope it helps. 
And if you're watching this, and for whatever reason you've never played Kerbal Space Program, or used the Interstellar mod, or some combination thereof, and you're wondering what on earth is going on, you just need to go out and get this game. Because this is what's going on. You, you make spacecraft, and you fly around, and you do crazy stuff. Why? Because you can. Okay, so there's one adjustment there done. That's gonna... Ah, uh, yes. Looking good. Looking good. So... Uh, we're going to approach the station at that point. That's that's going to be our approach point. We're going to warp here. And we're going to start slowing down. Eventually, we're going to catch up uh, around where those purple marks were um, that you saw on the map. Um, but this is where we're going to do our, our final burn to come in. It's just, you know, incrementally lining yourself up into the same orbit as your target. Uh, we're about 180 meter per second too fast. For, oh too much time acceleration, so now we actually done, done messed up, but that's okay. Uh, we're going to slow down. Okay. There we go. Burning off that velocity. Burning off that velocity. There's the station. Probably should have started this burn a little earlier, but I overshot it. <laughs> um, and there we go. Boom. All right. So burned off all that. So let's point at it. Fly towards it. And I don't realize it yet, but I'm about to run into trouble. And you've probably already figured it out um, as I'm doing this and not realizing that I am setting myself up for failure um, in a pretty bad way. Um, normally this would be just fine, you know, you just adjust, you know, so that you're pointing at your target, you fly up to it, flip around, and you kick on your engine to brake. What I forgot, though, <laughs> is, uh, is coming up. And it's a definitely an important thing to keep in mind when you're using the Z-Pinch engine is it produces massive amounts of radiation um, in the game that will prevent you from firing this without, you know, turning off the safety things. It, this, it will prevent you from firing your engine near, you know, a habitable craft or a habitated craft, like near other Kerbals, um, because it'll kill them. If you turn the safeties off and you fire it, your Kerbals will die. Um, so that's very, very unfortunate because I flip around here to, you know, I'm, I'm cruising in at like 20 meters per second, which I think is fine because I'll just be able to slow down, but I'm not going to be able to because I, I time warp in, get super duper close, it comes loaded in, and I try to fire my engine, and, uh, and I realize I'm in trouble because I can't. It, it will not let me fire the engine. I keep trying to turn it on. And it's like, no, absolutely not. <laughs> you shall not pass. Uh, because there are Kerbals aboard the station that I'm trying to dock with. Um, you know, if, if it were an un unkerbled station, there were nobody aboard, this wouldn't be a problem. But there are Kerbals on there, so I cannot use that. And so I think, okay, I'll just use RCS. Oh, wait, I, where are my airbags? What happened to the airbags? Everything was strutted onto this thing. My airbags are gone. I can no longer convert liquid nitrogen to gaseous nitrogen uh, to use as RCS fuel. And I only have 15 units of monopropellant on this craft. 15 units. So I can't. I can't stop. I can't slow down. I'm, I'm in trouble. Like <laughs> I can't use the engine to slow down, and there's not enough monopropellant to use the monopropellant to slow down and dock so by station see ya um guess i didn't plan this out very well <laughs> now i i could i could just you know start over and make a completely new video with that little issue amended but i thought i'd leave it in to show you my mistake because you know it's just i should have used uh rigid containers mounted somewhere else and then made sure that they were auto strutted those gas bags apparently cannot be auto strutted and so they flew off in warp um, at some point and I didn't even notice <laughs> until now and I do a little test here to see exactly how much Delta V I can burn off using just the monopropellant and I realize not enough before I run out um, so I think to myself okay this isn't gonna work 
should I start over? Should I cheat? I'm thinking to myself, I'll just save and then I'll cheat and then I'll explain it. Um, but then I just decided not to, honestly, is what happened. Um, I just kind of stare at my ship for a while, like, great, how do I fix this? Um, and then I decide, no, actually, well, I'm going to cheat. <laughs> uh, so here in a few moments, I, uh, I open up the cheat menu. Any moment now. There it is. Yeah, see. All right, so I turn on infinite propellant, and then I do a uh, cheat rendezvous. Where is it at? Yeah, right there. I cheat them. I cheat them together. So, you know, that's uh, that's so sad though. Like I figured I'd probably just dock it. You know, just just cheat it and dock it and be like, sorry guys, I messed up. But when you when you make these at home, um, any kind of design, you're gonna have to realize uh, that Z Pinch engine is super duper awesome. Its biggest drawback is it will kill anything outside of the vessel if you fire it. <laughs> it's deadly. Um, so uh, you definitely have to have some sort of maneuvering thruster that is reliable. Um, those resisto jets are great, but if you lose your ability to fuel them, you're not going to be able to do much. So I switch over to the station. Um, which has plenty of fuel aboard it to rectify the situation, um, but no way to attach anything. I don't have um, any kind of uh, extra. I don't have extra planetary launch pads installed at this point, and I don't have Kerbal attachment system installed at this point. So normally I would dock it right there. Uh, those other ones would be where tankers uh, would dock uh, using like long extended hoses um, at an angle because of the uh, little graphing things here. Um, but Obviously, when you design yours, you know, take into account how things are going to dock to it. This thing is designed to for specific tankers that dock with their ports at an angle. And um, I, I believe they introduced robotic parts. I, I saw some robotic parts in there. I didn't know if it was like some mod that I had left over. I didn't remember installing robotic mods. So I'm pretty sure like Squad or Take-Two Interactive um, updated this game with robotic parts so you can use a robotic hinge to adjust the position of the docking port uh, when yours is at an angle um, so anyway I put these on at an angle because I have craft that dock like that and it is a moot point now with robotic parts anyway I'm showing here the um, the particle accelerator is that ring that's spinning around there it's part of the interstellar mod it is a habitable ring that also functions as a cyclotron so that you can use it as a um, an atom forge basically you, you take protons and smash them and make deuterium or you make you know proton and like nitro hey, you make some carbon you make some lithium uh, you can use this thing to make antimatter <laughs> um, which is kind of crazy um, and, in, and it only uses a, like I think what was that um, eight eight megawatts something like that, of power for certain operations. Um, so it's a really, really cool cool tool. Uh, that right there is the antimatter core reactor. It uses antiprotons to generate electricity. You need to have a lot of heat dissipation. Uh, so bust out the radiator budget. I have this thing throttled down to 15% um, because I just was not going to put like a gazillion tons of radiators on this thing. And as you can see, it's capable of producing up to 120 gigajoules of waste heat. Um, fortunately, uh, the way this thing is uh, set up, it will actually, um, like, it can run at full power for a while without any issues. Um, w even without enough heat dissipation for that to happen, just because it, overall, it's not, it, it works. Just, you'll, you'll see later on in the video. I, I don't know the science of or math to explain it. It's just, um, you don't need the full 120 to run it for a short period of time. Um, extended, um, absolutely, you want like all the heat dissipation you can, but um, for that we just uh, throttle it down to 15% and then we're fine. Um, so right here we're looking at the positron and antimatter storage containers. Um, so what this, the function of this station is you um, collect antimatter around EVE and then you use that to power the antimatter reactor which then powers the positron um, 
maker, the, the cyclotron that makes the positrons, <laughs> I forgot what it was called, um, at an appreciable rate. Now, where we're currently positioned um, around EVE is not ideal for harvesting antimatter. Currently we're getting, uh, let's get that out of the way, a very f small amount, it's like 0 0.026 or something like that. Um, we have four of these on there, so every hour we're getting 0.1 milligrams of antimatter. Uh, we're using more than that to produce positrons, so we are we're losing antimatter as we go, uh, which isn't a huge problem at the moment because we have a lot. Um, and you don't you don't I, I threw this on here to show you that like you can't really use the antimatter reactor to make antimatter because it will use it up faster than you create it, and so you're just bur burning it for nothing. Um, you, so better use is to make positrons out of it. Um, which you can then use as a uh, easier store um, energy source for vessels like our little uh, derelict uh, craft there that I forgot to or that I failed to construct properly enough to actually survive the mission. Um, so I have to figure that one out later on, but they'll be fine for now. Um, they're brave, brave souls. They're very brave. Yeah, definitely. You'll be fine, Valentina and Sarah. You'll be fine. We'll we'll take care of you. All right, so um, generally speaking, you know, th this thing would have docked and, and you would have uh, you know, refueled it and it would have been, um, then it would go out and it would do its scouting mission of, you know, finding the sweet spot for antimatter for this thing to park in. As you can see, this station has warp coils on it, um, which is really, really neat. Uh, it's got the big, giant Alcubi air drive. Um, on top and then a smaller version of the same giant one on bottom um, gives it a warp to mass ratio of like over 1 to 100 which is important you want to have a massive ratio on a station this size because you want to move it slowly and you want to have enough um, power to power the warp drive at such a small fraction of the speed of light because remember when you reduce speed all the way down it requires a whole heck of a lot of energy to move um, at you know 0 0.001 times the speed of light, um, like three gigawatts of power. Now the station is at 15% will produce like 18 gigawatts of power or something like that, like 17 gigawatts of power. So that's not an issue at all. Um, but again, I, I recorded this earlier and put the voiceover, so I'm gonna give you guys a spoiler alert. I run into some issues that take me some time to figure out, and I left it in here uh, just in case you also run into this same issue. You will know what's going on. Because uh, we, we, we figure this out. So first things first, we're going to point this thing radial out, uh, which is basically up from the planet. If you were standing on the planet at the equator and look in this thing were directly above you, you would be looking at the antenna and it would be pointed directly away from you at our space um, sort of thing. So radial out from the equator or pointing you know sideways. Oh, incidentally, uh, with this thing able of producing so much electricity, so much power, and then microwaving it out the back with that antenna, uh, we could do some horrible things to the atmosphere of EVE over a prolonged period of time. You know, just microwaving that planet until it turned into a true hellscape. Um, that would be weird. But we're not going to do that. That would be a waste of power, a waste of antimatter. Instead, we're going to use this thing as a gas station instead of a Death Star. Um, but that's essentially what you got there, is a 120 megajoule Death Star. Or giga, was it? I, I forget. Was like 120 gigajoules? Not mega, yeah, 120 gigajoule Death Star. Um, so let's go ahead and start charging the drive. And immediately our radiators go from that calm, pristine black to this angry, angry red you can see from, from miles away. And in previous versions of this mod, um, activating a warp drive near another vessel would cause the vessel that wasn't part of the, the warp interaction to just cascade right into the planet. It would just lose all um, angular momentum and just fall right into the planet, and it would blow up. Um, and that was an issue. And Freethinker is super duper awesome and makes this mod so super duper awesome that he has corrected that. I didn't even know. I uh, just uh, loaded this up, did a few test runs, found out that that is no longer an issue. So I have no trouble, no no worries about Sarah and Valentina there uh, being safe when I when I activate my warp drive. Now the issue I do run into though is it does not appear as though the drive is charging. 
I keep looking at this and I'm like, why is it not charging? It's just sitting there at 0%, 0.1%, 0%, 0.1%. And it doesn't appear to be doing anything. So I'm looking around and I'm like, did I leave something on? Did I not do something right? Like 17, 18 gigajoules should be plenty to charge this thing. Okay, so I turn that off. And I'm like, did that start, you know, did that fix it? And what, what, what's going on here? So I, I, I poke around with my tools and I'm like, I start charging and it doesn't charge. Why not? So I do some diagnostics. I get the power management out and I take a look. All right, what's going on here? So did I pick the wrong warp drive? So I take the one in the back, no warp control window, meaning that's not the master drive. So I can't do anything with that, but it is still gathering exotic material when I, um, turn the thing on. Uh, so I'm like, okay, let's, let's try to charge. So we start charging and we take a look at our, our power management there. And okay, I'm confused. It says it's using power, but it is not doing anything. So at this point I'm, I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's a bug, maybe it doesn't work. So I like, I try a bunch of different things. I, I think at one point I quick saved and then loaded again to see if that would fix it. I think that's what I'm about to do. Yeah, so I'm just, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I'm like, why won't it charge? Zero percent. But no warnings go up. So there's the quick save. And then I'm like, all right, reload. So we wait for it to, re it's going to reload here. In there we go. Okay. So I'm like, okay, maybe this fixed it. So I try it again right away. <clears throat> and things start moving. So I'm like, okay, something changed, but it's still not charging. Why not? I, I don't understand. It looks like it's trying to charge, but it's not showing me progress. Um, so I'm like, all right, more power, right? That's, that's how you fix problems, more power. We'll get a little more, I conservatively step the antimatter core up hoping it doesn't explode with every step up. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, screw it, 100%. Okay, we're charging. Okay, great, this is, wait, it's slowing down. Take a look at my waste heat and management and I'm like, okay, are we gonna get this thing charged before it explodes? I'm, I'm a little nervous at this point, you know? I'm like, all right, we're, we're, we're cooking, but we've stalled. We're not charging past this point. It's not reading 100%, but it's not charging anymore. So I'm like, okay, what's going on? The reactor's working, everything, like, I, I, I'm, I'm just, che I'm checking all the instruments. Like, what is going on? Talk to me, instruments. I'm pumping 114 gigawatts of power, and this thing is not budging. Something's wrong. You know, I'm, I'm checking my waste heat. I'm stable. Somehow, this craft is sustaining all of that power and it's just sitting there. It's not exploding, but we're also not charging the warp drive to full. So, why? You know, what's going on? You know, is this, is this the right warp drive? Yeah? Alright, and so then I start looking at the amount of exotic matter being stored in this drive. I'm like, okay, there's 111, let's, let's lock that. Oh! that change something we're well that's into okay so if you look over on the left hand side you'll notice the charge changed when i uh when i clicked on that so that's that's our first clue that there's a mismatch going on with the two warp drives involved here um i didn't put them on with symmetry i just placed one and then i placed another so that's going to make a master slave scenario um in this case and then you know they're not going to charge evenly i guess and so I, I fiddle around with a few things and I'm like, okay, when I lock one out, it charges to this point. When I unlock it, it looks like it's full and then it immediately dissipates down to a certain level. It always finds the same equilibrium no matter what I do. Um, but that equilibrium changes depending on what's locked and what's not. Um, so I'm thinking it's probably because, not so much because I put one on and then another on, but it's because I put two on that are different sizes and it's charging them, but it's not calculating the charge required to move the vessel, like percentage-wise, correctly, because it's not filling either of them up, because between them, they have enough, 
but neither of them read that they have enough. You know what I'm saying? Does that does that make sense? Um, if it doesn't make sense, you'll you'll see what's going on. You'll you'll see what I what I eventually do is I just put this thing to full power and I adjust. Um, you know, I just keep clicking back and forth uh, between the um, the two different warp drives to see which one holds the most amount of charge um, in what scenario and what that reads at. And what I come up with is that there's more than enough stored because um, you'll see it, it'll read ready for a moment and then it'll drop back down if your if your resolution on your screen is high enough um if it's not if the resolution is not high enough for you to see what the numbers are actually saying um i'll just tell you it's going from like you know 10 percent to like 60 percent but it gets to like a 60 some percent and then it won't go above this one point um but if i lock charge if I lock one out it'll charge the other one up and then if I unlock that one it'll suddenly read that it has enough so I'm see there it goes again all right so I'm like okay maybe I can get it to activate like you know at a split second when I unlock it and then I think well I'm just gonna try to activate it what happens oh my god it works it did not read 100% but it sure as heck took right off and now you know, waste heat dropped right down. It's just moving right along. And I'm like, oh, that was cool. I check my orbit and I'm like really far out, but it's still circular. And it everything's still together. And nothing blew up that I know of. And yeah, everything works. So I'm like, okay, what's the antimatter? Okay, we're not getting antimatter out here. That's not going to work. So we have to turn back around. We overshot our target. But now we know that our drive actually works. It's just that the readout, the charging percentage is um, unhappy with the uh, ratio of sizes of my two different warp drives I guess and so it doesn't want to read the number appropriately but it is still uh, when it reaches that you know specific percentage where it stops charging that's actually full that that means it's full that means it can go um, so we don't need to worry about the percentage all we need to know is that when it stops it's charged and it only takes a moment to get there and it then maintains a comfortable uh, thermal pressure. So, like, we're we're good. You know, this thing is perfectly capable of... Re oh, by the way, the um, craft is being steered by the uh, warp control rings themselves. They have those really huge uh, reaction wheels inside. A um, lot of struts, you know, and everything. Everything is, you know, like, auto-strutted and stiff, you know, firmly attached and all that good stuff. So it just, um, you know, center of mass is in the middle. And it's got the two rings on either side, and it just flips it around ever so gently. And it's, uh, let's see, we're going at the slowest speed possible to creep our way back towards Eve. Um, and where we end up dropping out is around, I think, 1,200 uh, kilometers above the surface, uh, which is for Eve. Uh, you know, like, Kerbin's like 800,000 to 900,000 kilometers, like 836 or something like that, 850. Uh, this is a sweet spot for antimatter collection. Eve is like 1,200. At 1,200, um, so clicked on the wrong thing there, we're getting per antimatter collector, standard size, not scaled, um, a quarter of a milligram per hour, which means we have four of them. We're getting a milligram every hour of antimatter. We, we burn antimatter in like the picogram range. Um, so a milligram an hour, like we, 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 we crank our... our our uh, reactor back down to safe levels. It's like 15 percent. Um, we go in here and we are adjusting back to normal, uh, meaning that we're pointing the top of our station in the direction marked as normal or north um, there on the uh, nav ball um, so that it gives us the appearance of orbiting parallel to the planet. Because I don't know why, just because I like that particular orientation. Um, you might want to position your craft differently, but I like when mine are kind of like upright relative to the planet, I guess, when viewed from orbit, which would be sideways if you were viewing it from the planet's surface, um, but who cares? Uh, that's okay. All right, so we check our uh, positron factory here and we turn it on. Requires two, um, two gigawatts of power gigajoules, which is like 11.5% of our antimatter reactor's uh, capability, which basically means our heat dissipation requirements are minimal. 
and we are getting a significant amount of positrons here. Um, I mean, you don't need a lot. Like, one positron is going to last you a good while. Um, it's like, uh, I think one positron will get you, like, one or two jumps with that small craft. Um, more. Uh, that's, like, including, like, you know, adjustments and stuff. Like, it'll, it'll take you pretty far. Um, so, right here, I'm going to check to see how much antimatter we're using relative to how much we're collecting. And we're looking here, and we are seeing that our antimatter storage is going up. We are using the antimatter reactor to produce positrons while simultaneously collecting antimatter from the sweet spot in the Van Allen belt around Eve, which is putting us at a profit, like a net profit, as far as uh, materials. Uh, we are collecting antimatter at a greater rate than we are consuming it, as well as using it to produce positrons. This is an all that matter factory. This is like a good factory. So this thing would, you know, if it were constructed properly, um, be able to dock with this station uh, refuel on positrons whenever it needed to. Um, that station could simultaneously, you know, drop from its current orbit into an orbit closer to Eve so that it could collect atmospheric particles, namely nitrogen, so that you could refuel the Z pinch engine. Um, and then it could just go right back out to collecting more antimatter. So it's, it can do a uh, dual purpose. Um, but again, I decided not to cheat, um, even as much as I wanted to, um, uh, with these, uh, ladies are going to do is warp back to Kerbin, and a rescue vessel is going to come up and rescue them, and then a redesigned ship will be provided to them for their next adventure. Um, so you'll see them in your next video. Thank you so much for watching. Um, obviously, any and all questions you got, like give me some ideas on what I should do for the next video. Uh, once these ladies are rescued, they will go on that adventure for you. Have a great one, and thank you again to the everyone in the in the community for everything that you do for this game. God bless.